So, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much for joining us. It's very nice. I'm looking out here at a bit of sunshine, which is nice. Makes a word of welcome change after uh, the last few uh, weeks of pretty cold and miserable weather. But uh, anyway, thank you for you giving us your time this morning, and I hope that this will be a very useful session. So we're going to be talking about building with nature, what, how, and why. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Gerard Jerome and Richard Heath, who are going to be able to take us through the session. Next slide, please, Richard. This is something very close to our hearts and really is sort of linking in very closely with what we're doing as a business and what we're trying to do as a business and how we're working with our clients. Our vision to see land managed and used in a sustainable way, it's absolutely core cool to everything we do. And um, it ties in with our thinking. And as a business, we're shaped by uh, the way we, we're set up is through our five business units. And all of these, soils, forestry, landscape, ecology and arboriculture, all linked together to give us a, a really good understanding of this space. And we understand how these things can come together. So it's great to be able to uh, be working with a standard where we can see these things being recognised. We can see green infrastructure really coming into the heart of people's thinking and um, we can help to shape the way we uh, manage and uh, utilise our land going forward. And I hope that all of you will find that the discussions we'll have over the next hour and a half or so will be informative and will give you a, a really good feeling as to how this uh, how this standard's going to work and how we can apply it to projects that we're all involved with. Next slide, please, Richard. So I'm delighted, as you know, my name is John Lockhart. I'm chairman of Lockhart Garrett and delighted to be hosting the event uh, here today. And also delighted to be joined by Dr. Gemma Jerome. Uh, Gemma is the director of Building with Nature. So she is exactly the right person to give us the information this morning. She's been working um, uh, her background is a planner and she's been working in this sector, working with the stakeholders, with industry and so on over the last six years to develop a standard that will um, be usable and workable in, in the space that we're all now involved with. And once uh, Gemma has given us that introduction of, um, to the standard, Richard Heath, uh, one of our uh, landscape consultants here at Locker Garrett, will be taking us through the how. So how do we use it? How do we apply it? And how might it be relevant to some of the projects that uh, you're involved with? Um, so uh, that's how we're going to run the session. And there will be plenty of time at the end of the session for questions and discussion. So please, as we go through the session, do feed questions in as, uh, as you think of them, and we'll pick those up. And also, uh, after the session, if we haven't been able to pick up on all of the questions, we'll try and make sure that we come back to people and um, answer those as best we best we can. So before we just get started, there's a little bit of audience participation. So we're going to run a little poll now. Were you aware of Building with Nature ahead of this webinar and its associated publicity? Very simple. If you just want to click on your screen, a yes or no, we should get a result very quickly on the back of that. And um, uh, you know, be, be useful for, uh, to see where we are just as a, as a start of a tent. So Vicky, if people can uh, apply to that poll, and then when we've got a little bit of a result, Vicky will close that and we should be able to see it on the screen. Right, okay, so 64% were, 36% not. So a really, um, uh, you know, good understanding of where we stand at, at this uh, at this point. So now delighted to hand over to Gemma, who's going to set the standard for green infrastructure and give us an understanding of what building nature, building with nature, is about. So Gemma, really looking forward to what to hear what you've got to say. Thank you. I'm just going to get my slides full screen for you all, and we should be good to go. Excellent. Thanks so much for the introduction there, John. And it's really great to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, lovely introduction. So I am Gemma Jerome, the Director of Building in Nature, and um, I'm going to do a quick run through what is Building in Nature. So particularly for those 36% of people who are hearing about this for the first time, but also um, hopefully a really good refresher for those who have heard of us. And actually, even though you might have heard of us it might just be that you know we exist and you don't know exactly what we do and how we can help you do what you do. So I'm just going to set my own timer there because it's good to um, 
keep myself moving through these slides. So the first thing to say about Builder in Nature is we are the UK's first benchmark for green infrastructure. So we're a quality standard. We set the we set a benchmark across industry. So this is the built and natural environment we're interested in. Green infrastructure features. Um, being the, uh, the natural and semi-natural features in and around the built environment. So we are um, helping you understand what quality looks like. The, by doing that, we, we have a framework of standards and that's underpinned by um, 23 standards that, that um, it take and in turn uh, define uh, high quality green infrastructure. Standards um, are, are there to help you understand what good looks like. So we do that by assisting directly with industry partners um, via assessors like Richard. We can help you bring forward a great master plan, but we also work directly with local authorities. So making sure that the planning authorities that applications are coming forward in also understand what good, good looks like. And then we can have a really good joint decision making process and deliver great places for people and wildlife. So that's what Building in Nature is all about. We're able to say that we are the national benchmark for, for high quality green infrastructure because we have all of these partners on board with us. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you look through those logos there, but you can see that we're comprised of a mixture of professional bodies, leading experts in green infrastructure and representatives from both industry and government. So that means we're always keeping the, the, the baseline of quality moving upwards, but also making sure it's really realistic that we can actually support industry to meet this standard. We're about raising the baseline rather than just awarding the exemplars. And these bodies here really help us make sure that we stay in line with um, new policy, new legislation, and also industry good practice. The key thing to understand about Builder in Nature is it's all about quality. We do have other methodologies and assessment systems out there which focus on the what. They focus on metric-based systems, they help you tick boxes, and that's fine, but Builder in Nature is different. We're interested in the how. How do you deliver quality? So we've created a set of standards and we also have a user guide which you can access through an approved assessor like Richard at Lockhart Garrett. And that helps you then to draw from that evidence and good practice guidance. We've pulled it all together in, into one place so you don't have to, a one-stop shop for understanding. Well, green infrastructure, it's about ecology, yes. It's about landscape, yes. It's also about arboriculture. It's also about engineering. It's also about sustainable drainage and how that all works within a development and that might be a residential led development it might be a commercial development a community infrastructure development so we wanted something that could work across all of those types and scales of development and also critically through the whole life cycle of green infrastructure so at each stage of the development and planning process so whether that's at the reba stage zero when you're just deciding what what you want realistically to fit on that site how you're responding to the landscape character how you're getting that density in all the way through to implementation making sure all of your contractors are on board in terms of the quality you want and the quality that's actually built into that planning approval and then as we have found time and time again, the real critical stage of how you keep those green infrastructure features high quality into the long term. So that management and maintenance period as well. These standards help you with all of that. The message of this slide is we're doing it. We launched these standards in 2018. And since then we've been working in partnership with industry and, and planners to deliver schemes. So over 50 schemes are using the Builder in Nature standards and new schemes coming online all the time. And we've got a UK wide um, context. So from central Scotland to Cornwall, we've got people using these same standards. Think of them as holistic design principles. They're not prescriptive. That's how they can work in an English, a Welsh and a Scottish context because the policy and legislation is different in each of those planning um, systems. but what good looks like isn't different. We know what good looks like and it's always context driven. So this isn't a kind of tool which says, here's the number, the number is three. Here's the, here's the answer, it's X number of hectares of this type of green infrastructure in this place. It's not like that. Other tools do that and this can be used in conjunction with these other tools. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about examples of those such as biodiversity net gain. But the key thing here is that quality is always about context. And that's what Building in Nature is all about. So how can high quality green infrastructure help to deliver better development? A couple of slides here, just to make sure we're all on the same page. 
what we're interested in here is placemaking, which is much wider than one particular discipline. So this isn't, it's called building nature, yes, but it doesn't mean it's a just an ecology tool. This is about people and wildlife. And one of the biggest challenges that people face right now is the climate emergency. So building nature can help you make good on your commitments to address the climate emergency, whether that's through mitigation, so including features which can help with really tricky problems, for example, urban cooling or sequestration of carbon, what features do you use to do that? Well, it depends on, on the place you're working, but we can give you guidance on that. So that's about reducing carbon. Then we've got adaptation, which is about responding to existing carbon in the atmosphere and how that's affecting the climate. You know, as John said at the beginning, we've had really miserable weather. Sometimes that feels seasonal, sometimes actually it feels quite chaotic. And that's what we're going to be facing more and more with climate change. So green infrastructure can absolutely be your best friend as a design tool in your palette making sure you can actually create places which are safe for people so one example of that which is really tangible is making sure that your primary approach to flood resilience is through sustainable drainage above ground soft green features that can help hold water in the landscape and actually then bring you other benefits for amenity for biodiversity you can see that on this lovely image here of a development in the southwest we also have um, a focus on climate positive behaviours. How do you want people to enjoy living in the developments that you bring forward? So one use of green infrastructure is making sure that people um, enjoy, uh, actually make that modal shift. So if we want people to cycle and walk instead of drive for some of their journeys, then make sure you've got safe, green, convenient routes and green infrastructure, again, can be one of your best design approaches to do that. The other aspect of this is that we are also facing an ecological emergency. What does that mean in terms of how we're building green infrastructure? It's making sure we retain, create more of and enhance for nature. So the simple way of saying that is make space for nature. We've got more and more legislation drivers around this. So we have the introduction through the Environment Bill of nature recovery networks, local nature recovery networks, and then local nature recovery strategies of how we actually do that. So when you're bringing forward a development, have a look what's happening in your area, in your district or in the in the sub region. What are the drivers for change? How can we actually underpin those nature recovery networks by including more and better and better connected green infrastructure through your developments and also out into the wider environment? And that's how we make biodiversity gains. So, yes, there's a, a, a very specific methodology about how we accredit schemes of biodiversity net gain. But what we're talking about in building a nature terms is making um, making those gains through quality delivery of, of green infrastructure. The next um, emergency we would argue we're facing is a public health emergency. We've seen more and more people focus on the time that they have in nature when we've been locked down. So that's helping us realise and bring um, shed more light on an existing issue that we've had for a long time, that the access um, um, of, of where, depending where you live, it's almost like a postcode lottery will depend on how good the access you have to high quality spaces is. And yet all of the evidence shows that you, we will be able to support better outcomes for people, health and well-being outcomes, if we have access to high quality green space and natural green space. So what we're talking about here in Builder in Nature is making equitable access and making inclusive spaces that encourage everybody to use and enjoy green infrastructure. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a key part of Builder in Nature, our approach to, to GI from the point of view of the existing and new communities we're building for. And then finally, if we can build places people want to live, we're actually contributing to the economy as well. We've got a big narrative at the moment in terms of how do we build back better, build back greener and how green infrastructure is a key part of that. So valuing our nature based solutions and thinking of this as a place making approach. OK, how are we going to do all of that? We do that with our standards. So the Builder of Nature standards are our essential ingredients for high quality placemaking. And we do that through a set of thematic standards and essentially think of these as the key ingredients. It feels simplistic, but we've been, you know, we've spent a long time refining the standards and actually it does come down to these few key areas of design. So 
yes, we've got our core standards, which really help to differentiate green infrastructure from a conventional approach to green and open space. And that is key to building with nature. But then beyond that, it's these three W's. It's the well-being, water and wildlife. And thinking of your green infrastructure as making nature work hard and smarter for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about multifunctionality, for example. But it's it, it this helps to push back on some of those arguments of who well, we can't deliver a viable scheme if we have to deliver all of this green space as well as all of this built um, as well as all of these houses or employment units. Well, actually, for if you're if you're really understanding what green infrastructure is, you can do that with less space for um, for green infrastructure. It's about quality, not quantity. So that's a really important part of building nature, working within the, um, yes, the constraints of the site, but actually maximising the opportunities and seeing green infrastructure as an asset. So um, there are five core standards. We talk about um, multifunctionality throughout the benchmark, and that's really building what I've just said, that it's actually making sure within one area you've got uh, benefits coming forward so you um you yes you might deliver a, um an area for play but that can also be an area for wildlife and actually if it's um if it's brought forward in the right way uh, from a topographical point of view from a management and maintenance point of view it can also deliver um as, as part of your sustainable drainage system as well so it's thinking um it's, it's thinking in a more clever way, and, and that's the key role of the design team, which I'm sure Richard is going to talk about later. We talk about the importance of local character and starting with what's good and building up from that. So we get more of um, we get more green infrastructure that is actually creating a sense of place and building on what's really high quality about a place already or creating a high quality place, which is building on the, the assets of the local environment. We make sure that you are responding to the wider context. So thinking about what's important, yes, from a planning point of view, but how do we nudge it up beyond compliance? So how do we think about, for example, if your local authority has declared a climate emergency, they'll be looking for ways to make good on that um, for, the, for all of their community stakeholders, for their elected members to be able to tell a story as to what they're doing. And actually, we as planning applicants can, can help them make good on that by saying, well, actually, the way we're approaching development here, instead of always objecting to development, let's see development as a positive where we can actually contribute against some of those targets. Making sure that the scheme itself is, is um, making good on those commitments to deliver environmental quality and for the features themselves to be resilient to climate change. So, for example, making sure the species that we select will be able to withstand different temperatures and different amounts of rainfall. And that's the kind of future that we need to need to be thinking about now. And then, um, as I've said a number of times today, it's making it easier for you to, to decide the best management and maintenance uh, strategy for a particular scheme. And that will depend on the scale and the type of development. But it's really critical that we build that into our design in the first place, because we want these features to, to, to outlive um, our investment in that scheme so people can continue to enjoy the benefits of them long into the future. We've got a set of wellbeing standards. I'm just going to summarise some of the key uh, drivers behind these standards. We're talking about accessibility, we're talking about inclusivity and also about place distinctiveness and, and how actually that helps people to thrive and feel a sense of belonging. The water standards, yes, they're about quantity and quality, so very much in line with the Syria Suds Manual and, what that, and what's driving good practice with sustainable drainage. But it's also about making um, more of the water in the landscape. So rather than seeing it as an engineering issue that needs to be modelled and, and just kind of seen as a, as a constraint on a site, actually having water on your site can be the absolute asset in what makes that place a great place to live or work. Um, and so it, it's it's making the most of the amenity and biodiversity benefit of water. And then finally, the wildlife standards, we're, we're, we're thinking here about those principles which were, were, were put really front and centre 
almost 10 years ago now with the Lawson Report, more bigger, better and more joined up. So we're helping you make good on those commitments and we're seeing those commitments reinstated through all of the new environmental legislation coming through. Um, but it, we need to also make sure that any biodiversity measures that uh, we put into development are actually relevant to what we're wanting to to, to deliver in that area because of what makes sense in that area. So we're talking here about locally relevant and also features that contribute to a wider than ecological network. Um, just a note on that in terms of how we sit alongside biodiversity net gain then. So just to be really clear, biodiversity net gain that um, primarily people will be encouraged to use the DEFRA metric to measure that. It's a quantitative measurement and has to be underpinned by the use of a robust metric and it's about assessing pre and post development biodiversity value. It's only being used in England at the moment and um, it's about delivering on BNG policies from the local authority and will need to be accredited through a different means by the local authority. So you can use your biodiversity net gain credits to help support and underpin your, your building with nature wildlife standards but you have to do both if you're in England and that's a mandatory requirement you can't just say I'm doing build with nature so I've done my biodiversity net gain but if you're delivering high quality green infrastructure which has been designed to support the local context including the ecological context and the opportunities there you will be in line with your biodiversity net gain approach so the two work really nicely together okay so the end point of of actually applying those standards formally is that you can pursue building nature accreditation and the end point of that if you're successful is an award so we have a set of awards we have the design award for um an outline master planning process and then the full award which is the real focus of building nature because the full award includes a post construction check so once your phase or full development is completed we come back and we assess based on what you said you were going to do whether that has been delivered and that provides so much reassurance to some really key stakeholders obviously the local authority are interested in that including the elected members but also communities and then for you as the developer it's about saying we now can tell the story that we it's not just us saying this is a good scheme we have an external verification which says this is good and this is good um according to a national benchmark experts in green infrastructure so in terms of the type of development we would encourage um to, to pursue accreditation as i said a couple of times this isn't just residential led development mixed development commercial community infrastructure absolutely encourage applications and we have examples across our portfolio of those it is primarily for major schemes upwards so in english planning terms that's 10 units or more and um, so we do have examples of those smaller schemes it's also for um for larger schemes and um, so we have five scales across the building nature um accreditation system and i'm happy to take any questions people have about the nuts and bolts but the key thing to understand here is that we have an award for you so it's a really good way of being able to reassure a whole set of stakeholders about the quality of your of your design and then the, the the end point of the building and nature accreditation process is this fantastic national award which is now being delivered as part of the landscape institute awards where we then can spotlight what good looks like on the ground so you are only eligible for a national award once you've had your post-construction sign off and we can really make the most of pointing others in industry to be able to look at your scheme and go this is what we mean by builder with nature so that's the accreditation system and the journey itself just a little graphic here to show you ideally you are moving through the stages so not every scheme has an outline stage so yes you might skip the design award but we do see some schemes where they still see the value of that because they you know they really want to to show um the planning office officers, for example, that they're on track to, to really embed these principles into their design. But then you'd be moving on to a full award. And then, as I said, you, you know, the national award is the, is the final stage. And just a little bit of understanding there that there's different um, applicants at each stage. Um, but again, happy to take questions about the details of that later. Here's a summary slide then as to what we found the benefits of a builder and nature approach to be. First things first, if you are using a quality standard that isn't an internal self-certified uh, approach that actually is a is a national benchmark 
um, that's underpinned by a robust evidence-based set of standards, then that's going to really reduce the uncertainty um, when you are bringing a planning application forward. So this is this is what we're finding, that kind of triangulation between what Builder by Nature says, what the, the applicant, the developer applicant um, says, and then what the local authority are looking for. If you can help say how your development is meeting the local pro uh, policy priorities, is, is actually in line with what good practice looks like right now around green infrastructure, that can help reduce planning uncertainty. That can then help to smooth your passage through planning because let's face it local authorities are stretched and if there is a way for them to better understand what the what the value and the assets of your scheme are from a natural environment angle that is only going to benefit their appraisal of your application too if you can show how you're securing benefits for people and wildlife whether that's through biodiversity enhancement health and well-being outcomes sustainable water management contributing to landscape connections that's going to help much more effectively tell the story of why your development is a good development and then in turn what can help us um, what helps us help you is to work with an approved assessor who is then an integral part of your design team offering very practical ideas of how you can address the climate health and ecological emergencies what does that actually look like in terms of how the development should be different how to design it differently what features to include what to foreground what to background what process at what points would be good to really have that quality check so i know richard is going to talk more about the how but just to drop the idea in there at this point that's what we're hoping we do with building nature it's a very practical how to approach for industry but it does have these wider more strategic benefits of then you being able to tell your story have that external verification which then benefits other stakeholders not least the local authority who you're looking um, to get support from for your development application okay so again another little summary of who's the benchmark for we feel that it's these three groups so yes it's for developers helping you to um to show how your development has value yes it's for planners who are looking for outcomes from development to meet their policy priorities and their targets around the climate change and the ecological and um, the climate emergency and the ecological emergency but also from a from a community point of view so the public as it says on this slide it's it's helping people understand what good looks like so they then start asking for that as well so if you're you know if you're a resident um let's say you're going through a regeneration process and there's a lot of experts coming in and saying it should be like this it should be like that how do you actually have agency to be able to say well i think um if if if, if this development has um an, an extra verification of quality that helps me understand why it's better so think of green flag most people see the green flag flying in their local park they don't know what that means in terms of what are the criteria of quality to get a green flag award but they know it means their park is good and they should feel proud of that so we hope that builder in nature starts to have that same traction that same um, brand recognition and quality assurance for communities that they then start to understand well this scheme is 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 doing more than just delivering houses it's delivering homes it's delivering places and it's delivering a kind of a way of life a lifestyle which means i have more access to the outdoors to nature um, and we know that is a growing trend um, especially accelerated by um by our experience of of being locked down um, okay we're going to have just a couple of minutes looking at a case study um, and I'm just conscious of time. I just think I'll be about five minutes more. Um, so this is an interesting case study because um, it's a regeneration project and the opportunities for inclusion of green infrastructure um, were, were really, really high, but the site itself was very constrained. So we use this case study um, quite often to show that how compared to some of the misconceptions about green infrastructure, this isn't about getting 40%, 50% green infrastructure, or should I say 40%, 50% land take, 
Um, and that's what we mean by a green infrastructure approach. Actually, it's about the right features in the right place, really designed, and then a commitment to managing and maintaining those features to bring benefits to the people who live there and also to add in new opportunities for wildlife. And also when we say people, every community is different. Every um, community has their own needs and strengths. So there's a really interesting story to tell here um, about that as well. So Barn Barton is a, an existing estate in Plymouth. This is an image from the estate. Um, you can see the quality of the built environment is very poor. There's a real need for, um, for these buildings to be replaced. So we are talking here about a demolition and rebuild. Um, there's certainly, we're, we're beyond cosmetic um, improvements here. Um, we, we, we have an existing community who've been here for um, it's an established community. So some people who live here have been here for generations. So yes, although we're coming in as built in natural environment professionals and saying there's a lot that needs to change here, there's also a really critical understanding that that needs to be done sensitively and it needs to be done in a way that brings the community on board um, and, and, and doesn't lose the trust of that community. So strictly from um, a... Um, a planning um, and development opportunity point of view, you can see on this um, this aerial image here, here that that you can just about see the faint red line of the of this is one phase of uh, um, of regeneration of a wider um, plan for regeneration over the whole um, of over the whole area. But it's one neighbourhood within that, and its proximity to some existing green infrastructure. So the black is wood here to the east of the site. Um, there's a real opportunity there to get some linkages across. One of the key characteristics of the site is it's a very steep sided slope. Um, so you can see the levels and drainage diagram there and you can see it on this slide as well. So I would say from a green infrastructure point of view, we don't actually have green infrastructure here. We have green space, we have open space, but it's very monofunctional. It's, it's really the leftover space between the buildings. So if we were if we were approaching this um, this scheme with a green infrastructure ambition, we'd be saying, how do we make this? Um, how do we make this space that people want to use, people can use? Because let's face it, these kinds of slopes mean a lot of the residents, especially those who are less mobile, less active, won't be able to use these spaces. And, and you know, our experience is that um, in terms of observing and, and watching how people use these spaces, they're just they're just a, a location for the buildings. People are not sitting and gathering and playing um, in, in a, a very active way through these spaces. So lots of constraints on the site, but then that means lots of opportunities. From an ecology and um, and a, a, um, from an ecology point of view and, to, and a biodiversity point of view, again, a real lack of nature here. Lots of amenity grassland, very tightly mown on a strict uh, rotation just to make sure people feel that it's being managed, but actually it's not being managed in an interesting way. Um, and there is lots of opportunity for improvement from a green infrastructure point of view. So the developer here is Clarion Homes, social housing provider. These units will all be replaced, but um, will continue to be um, partly social housing, but also they're introducing some um, market um, units as well. And we, um, we're we looking, uh, it's about around the 204 um, um, unit um, density here. So here's um, some slides now to show the thinking from the design team about how they're starting to then see the site through the lens of builder in nature and that's how the standards can really work for you that you you think of the standards layering up so well-being water wildlife that has to happen throughout the scheme but if we just take well-being to start with let's have a you know let's think about how we're actually introducing more permeability on the site introducing areas where you can stop and sit a while and in, and enjoy the tranquility of the site oh that's telling me to hurry up um making sure that people actually um, everybody has spaces that they can um, enjoy being outside and be active or as I say um, be be still so it's it's the variety of spaces and um, uh, that make 
um, the well-being opportunities really come to life. And then from a water point of view, very um, constrained site in terms of the level. So a big challenge was to actually um, be able to hold some of that water on site and really make the most of that. So rain gardens was a, was a really key approach here, but also thinking about permeable paving and other sustainable drainage features, which then can contribute to a more um, sustainable approach to uh, water on site and then wildlife thinking about those connectivity um, um, routes across the site in the way you would for people how are you then helping wildlife move across the site but also how are you introducing features which allow people to get closer to nature whether that's through integral features like bird and bat boxes or whether it's about using the opportunity for street planting as a way to improve your species selection so you're also then bringing benefits um, from a wildlife point of view. Um, so here we go, a nice image there of um, this site has been um, given planning permission. We're waiting for that scheme to start on site. It has a Builder Nature Design Award and it also um, was a recipient of a Landscape Institute Award. So really interesting site for people to look at. Happy to take any questions about how that's replicable in your context or how, how you would be looking at different issues. Um, OK, last slide from me then, and then I'll be really happy to pass over to Richard. Just to let people know that we are um, having a few key moments this year where we have um, I've got my colleague Sandra Took on board with me today who is going to be here to help me answer questions um, from you all later um, and Sandra is our head of accreditation has been, and standards and has been working with me to, to really um, look at the standards after three years of using them and make sure they're still in line with uh, policy legislation and good practice because let's face it there is so much happening in this area at the moment not just biodiversity net gain but so much focus on the climate and um, the environment. So that's a big part of what we do. We make sure our standards still represent quality so you can then just refer out to us. So um, we ha we, we're having um, a really exciting launch in a few weeks of our new standards. We've, we've reduced our standards to 12, um, which is, they're still very robust. They still represent high quality. All of the content from the first set of standards is still there, but it just makes it easier to use for people. And there's more focus on how do we address climate change and secure long-term management maintenance. And the last thing I just wanted to say is some of you on the call may know about the Natural England work. They're creating green infrastructure principles and also a green infrastructure guide in response to the National Model Design Code. And we're working closely with them. So I can reassure you that if you use the Builder Nature standards, you will be working in line with those emergent national approaches, which are also voluntary, but which are designed to help you bring forward good development. So the, the most frustrating thing for industry would be if we're all doing different things, but we're all working closely together and we're all here to make places that are better for people and wildlife. I'll leave that up there for a few seconds, but really the message here is just get in touch if you want to. Um, I'm the director and, and deal with everything to do with business development. So happy for you to take my direct email. As I said, Sandra's also here today as well, and she deals directly with with any of your ambitions to go for a Builder Nature accreditation, let's hear from Richard and see what that looks like from an assessor point of view. And then we also have training opportunities as well. And um, our colleague Sophie is the person to talk to about that. OK, thank you all very much for listening. I hope I wasn't thank too you. much over thank time. You, John. Yeah, that, was, that was a fantastic <laughs> introduction, fantastic run through and uh, the enthusiasm shines through as much as anything. And uh, it's great to hear that there is that connectivity and that crossover between uh, what you're doing and what's happening with the GI standards and what's happening across the across the sector. Uh, biodiversity net gain and so on is going to be with us on the back of the environment bill, but environmental net gain and the relationship between environmental net gain and what the building with nature standard is trying to do again, very key, very very important to make sure that we make those connections. So I'm now going to hand over to Richard Heath. Richard Heath is one of the landscape architects in our team here at Lockhart Garrett and Richard brought sort of forward uh, the thinking about building with nature, brought it forward to the rest of the team and indicated that it was something that we should be engaged with. It was very linked in with what we were doing. And um, he's uh, now a building with nature assessor working very closely with um, uh, Gemma and her team. And um, Richard, you're going to give us a little bit of an understanding of the how. So how do you do this and, and how can people engage? So Richard. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, as John says, my name is Richard Heath. I'm one of the landscape architects here. Um, uh, there will be a little bit of crossover with um, some of what uh, uh, Gemma has been speaking about, but just to sort of recap on how the standards work. And that's really what I want to do. I want to sort of bring forward a little bit more of the, the technicalities behind it. Um, so uh, the building with nature is, is based on a set of standards, which are, are sta uh, statements uh, to benchmark the quality of the GI provision. So essentially, um, the evidence is prepared and compiled for the, for, for the planning application uh, becomes the baseline evidence for the building with nature assessment. So assuming that the design process has taken account of the baseline green infrastructure provision, as Gemma was explaining, um, and the planning application references this throughout, then there's sufficient information to undertake an assessment. Um, so the statements um, or the uh, assessment criteria fall into these theme groups, uh, as Gemma was saying. So the core is the, the basics uh, of, of GI. Uh, so this assesses how the design delivers a multifunctional network, uh, ensuring that individual features contribute to a multifunctional network, green infrastructure, and they operate at a landscape scale. Um, it assesses how appropriate the scheme is to the location, um, how it reflects the character of the local environment, positively contributes to local identity, uh, landscape character, and it defines a sense of place which is really, really key to building new communities. Uh, in addition, it responds to the policy context. Um, it delivers local priorities and, and, and the needs that are identified through local plans and stakeholder nego negotiations. Um, so these, these core standards um, assess how the design tackles environmental impact, climate change by minimizing the development's impact with respect to carbon emissions, air, soil, light, noise, water, and it enhances the, uh, the quality of the assets on site. Um, the, the standards review the scheme's ability to adapt and how resilient it is in itself. Um, and finally, the core assesses the provision for long-term management and maintenance. Um, so it assesses uh, how the green assets are going to be managed and maintained, including funding, including the responsibility for delivery. Um, and then uh, the three uh, thematic uh, standards uh, or groups of standards um, start with the well-being. Um, so this theme aims at securing the delivery of health and well-being outcomes through GI provision. Um, it assesses the, uh, the accessibility that um, all people can use it, they can all enjoy it, um, they can, and it positively contributes to the green infrastructure. Um, the, the GI has to be inclusive, that it's designed to recognise the needs and strengths of local people and how these may change over time. Uh, the green infrastructure features can be used to, to be enjoyed at all times of year, and it's not just restricted to fair weather. Uh, it assesses how the design considers measures to reduce health inequalities, um, particularly key health inequalities that are uh, uh, recognised at a local scale. Um, green infrastructure should be designed and located to reduce and prevent health inequalities, both in new and existing communities. Um, the GI should be socially sustainable. In other words, the green infrastructure creates a social cohesion and inclusion to improve the community well-being um, and increase, increase this social sustainability. Um, and it looks at how distinctive the scheme is and how it contributes to a sense of belonging and pride and a sense of place in the neighbourhood. Uh, the water standards look at uh, the management of the site's water resources at all scales. And as Gemma was saying, it's about quantity, it's about quality, uh, and it's about um, integration. It's about how the GI network is integrated with the SUDS to enhance the benefits for people and nature. So it's, it's not just about dealing with the quality and the quantity, it's about how it's done. It looks at resilience, at how a diversity of GI features enhance water quality through more and better treatment stages, maximising the resilience and the efficiency of pollution reduction. 
Um, again, tying back to the core stand as we look at the water management feature, how the water management features are used to create a locally distinctive sense of place. Uh, and wildlife, um, this is about reconnecting the natural landscape. Um, it's about the Lawson approach of bigger, better, more joined up. Um, it's about how over time um, GI can contribute to to increasing the and reversing the decline of, of, um, of biodiversity. Um, it looks at the relevance of the biodiversity provision to its location and that the, the GI punches and, and flows through the built environment. Uh, and finally, it assesses how sensitive a scheme is and the opportunities to protect and enhance biodiversity are taken during planning and construction of the new development. So these 23 standards um, are essentially split out. So um, the, the core standards, uh, uh, number five, um, which deal, as I said, with the, the multifunctionality of, uh, of the green infrastructure. Your three thematic standards are, are divided into six uh, statements or, or, or standards in themselves. Um, and it's this that um, is is this these statements that we use to assess the development. Uh, so I want to talk about a working case study uh, to demonstrate the building with nature in context. Um, unfortunately, this is not as advanced as the uh, the um, scheme that Gemma was talking about. Uh, this project hasn't been submitted for planning yet, so. There's a lot of information I can't share with you. Uh, what I can say is that the scheme is registered with Building with Nature. The client has signed a pledge to work towards the accreditation. Uh, and this in itself is a useful tool to have in the pocket moving towards the pre-app discussions. And I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so as you can see from this plan, uh, the site lies in a fairly sensitive area. It's surrounded by ancient woodland, triple SIs, National Nature Reserve, uh, biodiversity, biodiversity priority habitats, public rights of way, historic monuments, etc, etc. Um, it also lies right in the path of an identified green infrastructure corridor. Um, so this proposed development is the second stage of a staycation park. Now, the first is completed and open to the public 11 years after it was conceived, which gives you some indication of the level of scrutiny and consultation that it went through before it was consented. Now, much of this was due to a lengthy stakeholder discussions, which might have gone much smoother if we'd have been able to demonstrate from the outset that we're committed to improving the GI provision, say with a pledge towards working towards a um, nationally recognised green infrastructure standard. Um, when you list all of the challenges related to this development, uh, it almost looks like a non-starter. And I think many developers would hesitate to commit to a site that is this sensitive. Um, but we have an optimistic project team. Uh, we, can, we can see that there's strong opportunities to use the development of the scheme to reinforce the green infrastructure network. Uh, deliver key benefits and of course the building with nature standards are the benchmark that we are using to ensure that this will happen um, um, because we're entering the design stage with this positive glass half full mindset we're able to view the constraints as opportunities and this is really really important with green infrastructure and with build, with the building with nature standard the single fixed point in this design was this desire to have a facilities building that's front and centre as you arrive at the site by vehicle from the north. Um, this location was notionally fixed um, and then we surveyed the trees. When we started looking at the, um, at the site in building with nature uh, in building with nature context, um, using the building with nature assessment um, component parts, um, 
we were able to to look at these these thematic standards at a at a uh, at a site level. Um, so the baseline relating to well-being is limited to a single point uh, public right of way. Um, clearly, design will need to respect this, but how can the existing baseline be improved to respond to the key messages captured within the building and nature standards? Um, so those are shown in list format here. So accessibility, inclusivity, seasonal enjoyment, health inequalities, etc. Um, now, we decided that limiting changes to the view from outside of the site was important. Greening up the uh, greening up the corridor would not only protect the recreational amenity of the users, users, um, but it would also help to strengthen the security of the site. Bearing in mind that this is uh, an area that's being rented out for, uh, for by by guests. Um, uh, so there's also an opportunity to provide a node of interest along the way, which could be uh, a picnic spot or equipped play area. Uh, green gym perhaps. Uh, but this is looking only one way through a window. Uh, the, the other consideration is the welfare of the users of the site. Now obviously uh, this would be a very this would be very different if we were talking about new residents on a housing scheme or employees on a commercial site. As this is a holiday destination set in rural countryside, you could say that the whole principle of the development is to deliver well-being GI. Um, the single argument against this is that it's not inclusive because it's not free. Looking at the water standards then, um, again, there's quite a limited baseline. There's no standing water or flowing water apart from a single flowing ditch along the, uh, uh, along the boundary. Um, generally, the site slopes north to south uh, with a ditch at the bottom. Building with nature principles are pretty uh, are pretty simple quantity quality multifunctionality resilience distinctiveness one huge benefit to a holiday park is that it's very low density which allows plenty of space to get creative with water you can look to incorporate play features into the suds uh, we can use ponds as amenity features as a backdrop to walks uh, maybe even look at wild swimming pool as an option in addition, we can use green and blue roof design to limit the uh, the runoff on the largest hard surface area, which is the facilities building. Uh, by thinking about this from the outset, it can be actualized by because retrofitting GI can be a much bigger challenge than starting with a with a bare site. The wildlife baseline was undertaken um, as you'd expect with phase one. Uh, and this plan shows that it's fairly limited provision despite being open green space. The real considerations come from outside of the site. Um, there's ancient woodland to the north and south, there's great crested newts camp just down the road, there's bats using hedges, there's badgers in the woodland, hazel dormouse records a mile away, ground nesting birds, rare butterflies, rare woodland plants. It's, it's quite an extensive list, but the site itself is fairly unconstrained. By responding to the principles of building with nature standards from the outset, it's possible to develop a truly meaningful design that maximizes the potential of the site, looking at the baseline considerations as opportunities rather than constraints. So in this case, we looked at opportunities to connect the two ancient woodland areas through the site. We looked at diversifying the landscape or uh, habitat types within the boundary. Um, this provides a, a habitat, ma mo uh, sorry, habitat mosaic, uh, which not only delivers key biodiversity points, but also stimulates people and increases their exposure to different wildlife. We look to mimic the surrounding landscape, increasing the provision of habitats targeted by locally rare species, such as areas of blackthorn, which are the primary so uh, food source of a particularly rare butterfly found nearby. Um, we considered how to address the decline of the ash trees from ash dieback, which is very pro problematic around this site. Um, so this is the, the current master plan, which shows this, how the scheme is progressing. 
Um, so the designer has taken each of the building with nature principles and it's worked them into a scheme, ensuring that the design responds to the local context. It delivers these key biodiversity objectives and maximizes the potential for, um, uh, for the value of the location. So, I mean, this case study demonstrates how leading with um, leading with green infrastructure and using the building with nature standards can influence the direction of the scheme. Um, but the assessment can be undertaken at any stage and the evidence compiled and prepared for the planning applications such as ecology, hydrology, landscape assessments, design and access statement, uh, the, the landscape design itself, the green infrastructure strategy, the management plans, all of this forms the basis for the assessment. The assessor is able to, to work through the supporting documentation and, and read the story of, of the planning process and then make a judgment as to whether the scheme has gone far enough to meet the accreditation requirements. Now, the earlier the assessor is engaged, the better, as this allows him or her to feed into the design process. If the scheme isn't quite there, uh, the assessor can make uh, suggestions that can help get it across the line. That being said, We've recently been engaged to look at a scheme retrospectively and provide a summary on how the scheme would have fared had it been put for building with nature. Um, this reflective view, um, this will help the client understand where they are and where they need to go uh, and what they need to do in future schemes to ensure that the developments are doing all they can towards delivering green infrastructure. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to hand back to John now. Um, but before I do, we've got a, a quick poll uh, to drop up. Um, and this is uh, obviously a, um, a, a very personal question. Would you be interested in taking Building with Nature forward um, on any of your projects in the future? Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for running us, us through that. Okay, so a bit of audience participation uh, once again, and we'll then move on into a Q&A session. So if you've got a question that you would like to pose to either Gemma or Richard, and also I'm delighted to say we're, we're joined by Sandra and she'll be able to pick up questions in relation to the new standard. So. Um, you know, please feel free to to bring those forward if you if if you've got them. And um, what we want to do is uh, either you can put those questions into the Q and A um, uh, feature at the bottom of the uh, Zoom page, or alternatively, uh, if you want to raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand, um, then we'll uh, unmute you and bring you in, and you can ask your question to the panel in person. So. Uh, Let's see how we're getting on with the, the poll. Vicky, do you want to sort of pop the results up when that comes through? Okay, so we've got a good um, a good proportion of the, the thing, 73% there, keen to uh, uh, see it and no no's, which is fantastic. So, um, right, uh, Richard, if you want to um, stop sharing your screen, I think that will take us back to the panel view and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you can see uh, those of us that have been speaking and um, uh, we'll be able to, to, to pick it up. So um, I've not got any questions in the question and answer box at the moment. So um, please, if you've got a, if your hand is up, then um, just let me know or put a, put a note in the chat. But um, Gemma, I want to start the ball rolling really. I mean, one of the things that um, I'm hearing a lot about at the moment was put forward on the back of the um, sort of consultation around the 25 year plan, and then subsequently the consultation that led to biodiversity net gain being embedded in the environment bill. Um, is, the, is the question of environmental net gain, that wider um, scope, which obviously is going to fall into the building with nature standard. But there's an awful lot of um, talk around this area at the moment as to how this should be measured and how it should be quantified. Um, local authorities thinking about standards, you know, and, and, and mechanisms to actually put some numbers to it or some, some actual values to it. Just wondered um, if you've got any thoughts as to how that you see that coming forward and how you see that sort of meshing in with the building with nature standard, because obviously the two 
hopefully if you've followed the pathway the building with nature is trying to take you down you should be meeting those environmental net gain standards and some i would think yeah absolutely thanks john for your question and um it's really nice to hear that most people would consider using builder in nature <laughs> i'm still <laughs> glowing after that poll thank you um okay so yeah it's a really it's a really key distinction actually um and i'm really glad you brought this up john because I think Building with Nature has always had environmental net gain at the core of what we're trying to do. And I mean, we, we started developing a um, set of standards and a benchmark for green infrastructure way before um, the um, environment bill and the 25 year environment plan was brought forward and biodiversity net gain as a key mechanism coming out of that. And, you know, we absolutely recognize the need for biodiversity gains as a core issue. I mean, just, we, I didn't mention this, but Builder in Nature um, actually came out of a wildlife trust. So this, this tool was developed in partnership with the Wildlife Trust and the University of West of England. So clearly biodiversity is important, but I think just focusing on that very discreet issue misses so many opportunities to deliver for the wider environment, to deliver for people. So I'm glad that you framed that as a, as a, as a commitment to environmental net gain, John, and, and just to reassure people that that as a concept which is more encompassing and more holistic and actually I think more naturally in line with how sustainable development and the built environment professions who who have always um, been committed to delivering more than just units and houses they have already been working in this way whether that's the materiality of the structures themselves or the processes or, you know sustainable construction is is also at the heart of building nature um i think so i think it's a, a natural evolution to have a standard which um supports and encourages built environment professionals to do what they've always done but to just have a, a little bit more understanding about the specifics for the areas around the building. So that's the focus of building in nature, but green infrastructure can support environmental net gain. And we actually do have um, in the new set of standards, we, we really hone in on that. And we have a standard which we've actually, um, we've actually framed as a standard, which is about maximizing environmental net gains through Brilliant. green infrastructure. Um, and I don't know if Sandra wanted to say anything more specific about that, <laughs> um, but it, it might be a nice, uh, a nice read across if you wanted to say anything about that, Sandra, or just add to what I've said um, from a kind of standards and accreditation point of view uh, in your capacity, just to bring you in. Yes, I mean, like Gemma says, we've, thanks Gemma, um, we've, we have reduced the standards down, we haven't lost any of what was in the previous standards, they're still very robust, and they're kind of continuing to raise the bar. So we have reworded our standards, and we've, but we have placed a, a really strong em emphasis on environment, environmental net gains as being, you know, one of the core standards. We've got six core standards, it's one of the core standards. Great. Well, we've got some questions starting to feed in, so I'm going to start the ball rolling now and uh, we've got a very interesting question from Simon Hargreaves thank you Simon so what are the costs involved with building with nature and can it be used for temporary developments such as quarries so um, interesting um, one there so uh, I'm going to give you that to, to you in the first instance Gemma yeah yeah thank you um thank you for your question Simon um let's get straight to the brass tacks why not <laughs> it's a, it's certainly a, a good place uh, to start in terms of thinking whether this is this is achievable and um, and proportionate to to the type of development you're working with so we have a fee structure which is accessible via an approved assessor so um, I'll leave that kind of circulation um, for your uh, relationship with with Lockhart Garrett and and Richard as an approved assessor but just to give a flavor because that is important and I know other comparable assessment systems like Briam, for example, Briam Community specifically as a master planning tool can prove to be very expensive, to be frank. So, um, and it's because they're they're designed to work um, um, primarily a much more strategic scale. So those very large um, new developments might follow that um, follow that approach. Builder in Nature, as I, I quickly mentioned in my presentation, we work across five 
scale. So we go from micro through to strategic. So micro, small, medium, large, strategic are our five scales. And we have associated costs with, with each of those. The thing to understand about accreditation so you can use standards for free, just to be really clear about that. You can download the standards framework from our website, builderwithnature.org.uk. You could do that now in the background, you'd have them there and you can be using those standards to guide your thinking. However, we absolutely would encourage and support you working with an assessor like Richard to really understand what is, what is meant by those standards, because whilst they're useful to have that definition of high quality, when you really want, when you really want to be, um, improving the quality of your scheme and being able to tell that story to those other stakeholders about why it's better than it would have been otherwise, how you are delivering against um, the policy priorities in your area, how you are turning those constraints. So remember Richard's example with all of those constraints, you'd just be thinking, oh goodness, I don't even want to develop that site. How you've turned those into assets and opportunities to make the development better. Um, you have to work with an approved assessor to do that and the approved assessors have the technical user guide. But um, in terms of what working with an approved assessor costs, we don't set the fee for the approved assessor. Accreditation is two stages, assessment and audit. So to work with an assessor, that's a contract between you and the assessor directly and you would decide with them. They would, they would instruct you, uh, guide you as to how many days the scale of your development would take on an assessment. But there is a fixed fee for audit. So the two stages are assessment and audit. Builder in Nature central team, so um, Sandra is our, is our lead auditor and then other people support her with those audits. That has a fixed fee and that's the bit I can tell you, Simon, which uh, ranges from a micro scheme, which essentially is 50 units or less, um, uh, um, depending on the, the design or full stage around the 1,600 mark up to strategic um, which is a thousand units or more, we're talking 7,800 for an audit. So it's, it, you know, the average is, is around 4,000 um, pounds for, for an audit. So that gives you a little kind of flavour. No, that's, that's useful. And obviously we can provide more information on that if needed. But uh, the other part of the question was temporary development. So yeah, temporary just, development. Just a, quick, a quick sort of comment. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Yeah. So what I would say with this, Simon, is that we... We, what we, we, we have a policy award, so we are working with um, local government to, to guide how they're bringing forward, for example, Gloucestershire have a minerals local plan, which would then help um, people who were developing quarries to understand better how to do that from a perspective of high quality green infrastructure. So Gloucestershire have had their minerals local plan accredited with Builder in Nature. So I think we're more likely to see those types of developments be in, informed and instructed by the policy document which has the Builder in Nature principles built mm -hmm. into it. So if you, for example, you were bringing forward a quarry development in Gloucestershire, you, it would be great for you to be able to say we have um, we have noticed that Builder in Nature is, is a key part of this, of this policy um, and that's guiding how that should be brought forward. And so we're integrating those standards into our thinking. Um, yeah, and we do, I'll just quickly say, John, we do have a couple of examples you can see on our website where we have um, developments which were, were, were quarry developments which have been um, developed into uh, residential development. So um, it, it, is there some quite interesting examples there? Uh, I, I think it, it's great. Now, I think regardless of the development, um, I think, Simon, you want to be thinking about integrating this thinking into the into those, you know, whatever scale and whatever, whatever um, time scale. Um, we've got quite a few other questions coming in. And one was about the uh, case study from Rob Champion uh, and the case study at Barn Barton um, and looking at whether the long term management and the way that that was structured was actually a, an important part of the uh, building with nature assessment. OK, I've just seen how many questions are, John. I'll try and be quicker. <laughs> no, that's OK. Well, we, want to, we want to make sure that we can answer as many. But what I said earlier is that if we can't answer them in the time yeah. frame, because we will close this out uh, quite tightly within the time frame, we're very well aware of people's time. So at 11.30. But um, yes, if you want to yeah. just pick that up quickly, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. So um, what I would say is um, the key thing to understand here is that we have a whole standard around long term management and maintenance. Um, so so um, one of our core standards is specifically about the, the, the governance arrangements and the uh, resource and mechanisms around management and maintenance. So as with um, Barnbutt and as with every case study, we what we focus on in the accreditation. So um, 
your your question um really rob in my mind is you know is that a key part of the accreditation process the answer is yes mm -hmm. but what is worth um, putting as a caveat to that is the builder and nature approach is not prescriptive and it's and 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 in this in this instance also we don't say it has to be this model it has to be this mechanism but what we do is we guide and and we we, we try and as, as sandra said raise the bar in those regards within the context of that scheme and depending whether it's early in the design process or or later um, and actually it's uh, closer to approval or even post approval, we'd be guiding the assessor. So uh, Richard in, you know, in, in his schemes, he would be guiding the design team as to how to most appropriately provide for long-term management maintenance. Oh, that's great. And one other question from Nicola Kingford, is evidence uh, that using the BFL is, is actually giving a direct positive effect on health and well-being? Um, yeah, that's a key okay. part of your standard, isn't it really? Yeah, so absolutely integral um, to, to um, is it, sorry, am I looking at Nicola's question? Any evidence yeah. that using building for life is that? Yeah. Um, yeah, building for life, building for a healthy life has a direct positive e effect on, um, in, <laughs> interesting question, Nicola. Um, I'm working with Homes England at the moment to, to trial the use of building in nature alongside building for a healthy life on a number of developments. So I think that's quite a live area of research. I mean, we certainly um, did an extensive literature review when we developed building in nature and we know the, health, the, the well-being standards really reflect what, um, what makes a difference in terms of, of, of contributing well-being. And we also have some examples where our standards are being used and we have a post construction check in place and some of the post occupancy survey results have shown that having access to high quality green infrastructure has indeed improved health and wellbeing outcomes. But I think what I'll say as a more general point, Nicola, and it's also a point earlier in the questions, it's, it's anonymous, but um, you know, do you see building with nature being incorporated into MPPF text in the way that building for healthy life is? That's, uh, I think I can kind of grab those two questions together, John, if I may. Yep. But um, we um, we absolutely um, we, we we absolutely understand that building in nature is a process standard. So I know that sounds quite academic and 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 conceptual, but it's really important to understand that we're not here to actually measure the outputs or measure the uplift in. Um, you know whether less people are um, are, are, are having um, health conditions, whether there's lower levels of obesity, but actually, in case people are thinking, well, that doesn't sound good. That's exactly the same with biodiversity net gain. Biodiversity net gain is a process standard. It doesn't actually measure your biodiversity gains because that could take 10, 20, 50 years time to actually deliver those gains. But what it does, the same way that Builder in Nature does, is it is it evaluates the process and the quality of actions you are taking to, to, to make it more likely that those outcomes will be delivered. And yep. that's the same with any of these standards. So um, I don't see building with nature being included in MPPF anytime soon because we are in a situation where we're being deregulated. But as a voluntary mechanism, we are all already referenced in the national design guide. So that's yeah. the MHCLG official document. Um, and we're also gonna be referenced in the GI guide that MHCLG and Natural England are producing. So that's as good as it gets for voluntary standards, I'm afraid. Absolutely, and with the new planning policy, I think we're going to see these things becoming much more to the fore, aren't we? Design is going to be right at the key of everything and the GI standards and the way that this this all ties together is going to be absolutely key. And um, um, John, sorry to cut across you, just a really 10 second thing. It, building for a healthy life is great, um, but it is a self-certification tool. And I think local authorities are really keen to see applicants um, being able to evidence more effectively what they're doing. So building for a healthy life is great, um, but what Builder in Nature does, which is just a little bit extra, is that it actually provides the evidence that you have done that and it's an independent accreditation. It yet. looks across the whole piece as well. It's looking more widely than that and seeing how that can mesh together with that whole green infrastructure piece. Um, We've got a question from another attendee there about the green space in the urban centres, the population where new build maybe isn't happening. Um, can building with nature be applied to green spaces that might be of low quality? In addition, should we value green space for, for sport as a massive driver and 
how do football pitches, for example, fit into how do sports facilities fit into this? I'm going to defer to Sandra and Richard now. I think they could both answer that better than me. So I'm <laughs> well, uh, who wants to have a go first? Richard, do you want to have a go first then? Thanks, John. Yeah, sure. Um, let me just move the question over in front of me so I can see it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, essentially, um, so the sports facilities provide, uh, provide a function within green infrastructure. Um, now, as we talked before, um, building with nature looks at multifunctionality. So it's not just about one thing or another, but um, it, it makes it very difficult. If you have a sports pitch that is just a sports pitch, it would make it very difficult um, to uh, to assess that under building with nature as as meeting all of the criteria because it wouldn't. But if it was integrated into a landscape that provided um, that provided other features as well and was part of a network that provided that space for nature and for the natural processes that we were talking about earlier, then the, then yes, um, the it, it, it forms part of a multifunctional network, and that's really, really key to building with nature. Yeah, it's that multifunctionality that, that's key. Sandra, anything from your side to add to that? Um, yes, just to say that often, you know, sports pitch is probably a good example where it might be in a sensitive landscape, and actually you will have to consider biodiversity. So, you know, something like the lighting, where you put the lighting and how it relates to any sort of dark buffers and things like that. Actually, I can really see that in certain circumstances, you might really want to use the BWN approach for something like a sports field. I mean, obviously BWN cannot be applied to absolutely every type of development um, in, in the sense that you may not be able to deliver a whole range of different um, benefits. But even if your main focus is sport, there's still potential for biodiversity enhancements within the site and connecting to biodiversity enhancements elsewhere. And, and there may, may even be opportunities for linking with public footpaths and things. So it, it can help you address community resistance, which there often is even to things like sports facilities, especially if there's flood lighting involved and traffic and so on. But it also might help you um, tackle the, the sort of wider ecological constraints that you have around the site. Yeah, it might, be, it might, might allow you, again, it's this fitting in, it's this connectivity, it's this context. Um, we've got a couple of questions that sort of link together, really, about the assessment process and who might be involved and how that how that works. And I'm, I sort of probably it'd be good, Richard, to get your thoughts on that in the first instance. And then obviously, uh, Gemma, if you've got anything that you want to pick up on, please do. Sorry, Richard, you, you're still muted. Yeah, you're off mute now. No, I'm not. Sorry, I'm pushing the button too many times. My apologies. <laughs> yeah. um, Yes, yeah, so uh, the question is about um, whether building with nature is predominantly a landscape discipline or whether other disciplines uh, can become assessors. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so uh, I know of ecologists that are um, building with nature assessors. Um, and I was having a very interesting conversation the other day with a drainage engineer uh, who's going for, uh, for his assessment training uh, very soon. Um, so the so the answer is yes. Um, now, uh, in terms of uh, what is required in terms of qualifications and experience, um, I know that uh, the the uh, assessors are encouraged to be chartered um, a member of a chartered institute. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually from one of our consultants, so uh, we can certainly have a yeah. uh, a chat yeah. offline. Um, uh, Gemma. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Rich is absolutely right. So it's green infrastructure is multidisciplinary. And actually, one of the reasons we started building with nature is because it falls with falls with between and across so many different disciplines. So as Richard said, we have um, everybody from ecologists to drainage engineers to landscape professionals. We also have people whose chartered membership is IEMA, so who are coming at this more from um, a quality assurance environmental management point of view. Um, yeah, we, we do encourage approved assessors um, to be able to demonstrate their commitment to continuing professional development. So that's why it's a handy, um, 
shorthand way of us doing that by asking um, that you are committed to the professional um, quality assurance of your own discipline, but we will consider um, applications from others, but it's subject to a conversation with myself. Um, the, um, the, uh, the other thing I just uh, wanted to flag from the last question is that when I read the question again, it talks about can building nature be used on existing green spaces, and I think that's just the that was just a slight nuance I wanted to pick up on, that actually it's an important point being made that a lot of what we talked about today is 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 development, new development, and um, whether that's um, kind of greenfield, brownfield or, you know, and regeneration, that's all a new application coming through the planning system. When it comes to how we actually ameliorate the quality of existing green spaces, um, you know, within um, our communities, that's an important point. And one of the things um, which we at Builder in Nature have, have thought long and hard about is, does it always have to be a new feature? The planning system, more, than, more often than not, will encourage um, through the development process, the creation of new features. And that's how you demonstrate that you're delivering against your commitment and requirements of green infrastructure provision. A builder in nature, we believe that in, in, in certain circumstances, improving and enhancing the quality and functionality of an existing feature as part of the process of bringing forward new development might actually be the preferred approach. So rather than just squishing everything within the red line boundary, you know, providing new sports provision, what about improving existing sports provision? And that would be perfectly viable within a builder in nature approach. This isn't a tick box exercise. You've delivered your neeps and your leaps. The planning process does that. You know, we're not a proxy for, for the planning system. And from a builder in nature, high quality green infrastructure approach, it might be preferable, for example, to provide a safe, green, convenient route from a development to the existing sports pitch and then improve that existing sports pitch. And that's how you get your, your kind of use and access um, um, met. So just make that point, John. Yeah, no, that's, that's really useful because I think a lot of people are looking at how they can benchmark their existing work and maybe mm -hmm. say, you know, from, from where, um, uh, you know, where, where uh, you know, where, where do we sit in that regard and how can we improve what we do? Are we already there? Are we, do we need to take a completely different approach? So I think, you know, thinking along those lines is, is very good. I mean, we talked a little bit about the way that the standard, uh, gem, you know, interfaces with um, the biodiversity uh, offsetting. And uh, do you see it as um, being something that you can, you can integrate fully into that or how, how, how are you how are you viewing that how are you thinking it's going to work together um so i think this could be a whole webinar itself john so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna touch on this lightly and i can see richard's put a nice provocative question in the for the panelists there um i think what i'll say on this and i and and this is something you know we really um we work closely with our assessor network to um to be advocates and champions of a, of a builder in nature approach, a high quality green infrastructure approach. And one of the, the kind of core characteristics of high quality green infrastructure is actually um, related to proximity and um, actual quality. Um, so having access to, whether that's physical access or visual and auditory access is a really big part of whether you can then use and enjoy that green infrastructure. So a big driver within Builder in Nature is that you're delivering your green infrastructure features close to where people are. And yeah, you're actually it's, it's bringing proximity, isn't it? And yeah, it's like bring, bringing nature yeah. to onto the bring doorstep. Nature to people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so really. I would say that whilst biodiversity offsetting, um, you know, that's a big kind of vehicle in motion at the moment and it's important to have spaces away from people if they're fo if, you know if the focus of 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 what that land um use is is strictly ecological and ecological um biodiversity gains for example but from a builder in nature point of view that's why the two are separate enough that if you do both you're not you're not doubling up Need to be thinking, need to be thinking more widely. Right, okay, we're drawing towards the end of our allotted time. And uh, thank you uh, to everybody who's uh, attended. 
Um, I hope you found the session to be useful. And in particular, thanks very much to Gemma and to Richard and, of course, to Sandra, who's been, uh, you know, uh, there uh, helping with some of those questions and obviously uh, will be there in the future if people have got further questions that they want to ask. We've obviously uh, provided details on the um, uh, uh, you know, the invite and everything else for contact and we'll be, uh, we've been recording this session. So uh, we will be making that uh, recording available and the presentations. So if you are interested in um, uh, receiving any of those, please just um, uh, let us know and we'll make sure that those are sent through. Um, uh, you know, we continue to run these sort of sessions. We've got some good backup information on the website around biodiversity, net gain and so on. So I hope that those of you that are attending today will take the opportunity to have a look at that. And hopefully if you've got any questions and got any thoughts, then uh, you know where to find us and uh, we'll be delighted to, um, uh, to, to take your call and hopefully to uh, give you some thoughts. So um, I uh, would like to... Uh, just round up by saying thank you again everybody for attending thank you for uh, your inputs and uh, your questions and i hope um, uh, that uh, we will catch up with you again in the not too distant future so with that i'll uh, uh, we'll close the uh, we'll close the session and thank you very much for your time thanks everyone thank you